Paul Tozer has had a storied career in games development, from working on Dungeon Siege to the Metroid Prime games, and more. In 2015, he released the Game Outcomes Project, showing us empirically which factors correlate with success in game development. More recently, he wrote a book, The Four Swords, A Parable of Leadership, which takes that empirical data and creates fiction around it, and throws in plenty of his own wild stories from his time in the games industry. He also wrote an interesting series of blog posts about decision modeling techniques and how they give us powerful tools in game design. So we open with talking about that, but I'll let Paul tell you more. Enjoy. I don't know if you remember, uh, I, I, I think I interviewed you mm -hmm. um, way back when uh, about a game that you were making and you were using the optimization techniques to make sure the game was perfectly balanced. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I, I also use those, I don't know if I told you, but mm -hmm. I also use those techniques uh, to kind of break another game uh, oh, wow. when I was back when I was running at uh, Kotaku. That's um, awesome. I, I broke Neptune's Pride 2. And uh, yeah, <laughs> whoever the poor schlub was next to me in that game uh -huh. had the optimum amount of spaceships heading towards him uh, by a certain turn in the game. <laughs> and, That's so uh, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, you... I, worked on a bunch of decision modeling stuff. And then I used some uh, evolutionary optimization techniques in uh, City Conquest, the competitive tower defense game. So the game's not available anymore, but it was fun making it. Super cool uh, idea as well, like the, the whole decision modeling stuff. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that is that that's I think at the time I was reading that you mm -hmm. like learned those techniques mm -hmm. in, in like the course of a management kind of yeah, uh, I got, background. So yeah, I went and got an MSE degree at University of Pennsylvania in a degree program co-sponsored by the Wharton School of Business. Uh, while I was there, I took a decision modeling class, and uh, it was just amazing to me because it was one of those things. It's sort of like, um, you know, my brain just intuitively understood all this stuff. Like I'd, I'd experienced it in a past life somehow, and I was like, I found the course incredibly easy, and it was like the professor would just drone on and on and on, and I'd be like, this stuff is so simple. What's amazing about decision modeling is it gives you a bunch of techniques where you can take difficult problems that you can't really solve by hand, describe them in the right way to, uh, you know, describe them the right way in like Microsoft Excel or something like that, or a, you know, good decision modeling tool. Um, you know, you, you can take something in Excel solver and say, here's my inputs, here's the output I'm trying to, to optimize, and I'm trying to either minimize or maximize the output, or I'm trying to set it to a certain value like zero, right? So what's the combination of inputs that's going to optimize that output the way I want, want it to be optimized? And the solver, you know, this Excel solver that's built into Excel, most people don't know it's there because you actually have to turn it on with a special option in the, in the settings, but it's there. Um, and you can just run this thing and without knowing anything at all about what connects those inputs to that output and the whole spreadsheet in between those, it's going to find the best, well, not necessarily the best, but it's going to try to find the best combination of inputs that'll satisfy your criteria. And you can put all sorts of different constraints on them and say, okay, these values have to be integers. These have to be floating point values between zero and 10, whatever. And so this, this was a class in essentially how to apply this to dozens of different types of interesting management problems, right? Give you one of my favorite examples, right? Let's say you're uh, this video game publisher and at the start of the year, you have like a $50 million budget and you have a list of like, you know, 70 different games that you can make with that budget, right? That you can start making with that budget that you've got for the next however many years. And you can say, okay, I got this this game that's going to cost, you know, 3 million to make estimated to do 5 million in revenue. This one will take three and a half million to make estimated five and a half million in revenue, uh, all the way up to like, you know, 17 million estimated 22 million in revenue, whatever. Um, and just figure out what's the optimal combination of projects that we should green light if we're trying to maximize our revenue, you know, and that's something where once the, combination becomes big enough, no human can solve that. You can't go through all those possible permutations by hand, but you can give it to a solver and it can come up with a really, really good solution, possibly the best, possibly the optimal uh, solution on its own. So it's a great way to, to represent the problem 
to a computer in such a way that you're saying, here's the search space. It's too big for me to search by myself. You go and do it and tell me what you come up with. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like having um, an extension of your brain and it, it changes the way you look at the world. And I go around looking for problems that I can plug into Excel solver. Cause it's just so much fun. <laughs> I was just thinking the exact same thing. Cause like, you know, it was so cool. It was such a cool lens to put over things because, um, you know, obviously like, you know, in recent times, you know, AI has been getting bigger and, you know, there's, there's more and more complicated tools to do this, but the beauty of it was its simplicity and the fact that you can do it like any sort of manager or projects sort of supervisor can do this in Excel. And then you start looking for things to apply the lens to yeah. because it feels so powerful. Oh yeah. It is incredibly powerful. It really, really is. It's awesome. That classical management training, um, it seems to be historically something that the games industry has been in need of and these like uh, even that that specific decision tool that we're talking about i mean making decisions in that way obviously you know producers have a lot of tools that they use but it's it's a it's a constant problem in game development as it is in video production where which is my background mm -hmm. uh where you have these creative conflicts and there were a lot of things in the four swords the book uh, as well as the game outcomes project, which I felt led to um, this place where it's like, we need to start making decisions uh, from a more analytical place. Mm -hmm. I'll refer to my notes here in Len Lencioni. Is that how you say it? Lencioni's Len model? I believe it's Lencioni. Lencioni's model. Uh, mm -hmm. So you found strong correlations between positive outcomes and the the final vision for the game being well communicated. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for the organizational structure being clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Gallup's model called 12, there was a strong correlation between positive outcomes and team members believing in the mission and or values of the org. So mm -hmm. those things to me kind of point to direction in a field where yes. there's, there's a lot of creative uncertainty. Yeah, there's always a lot of creative uncertainty in a game project, one of the biggest challenges always, always, always is getting the team aligned with what are we actually building here, right? Um, and, uh, you know, ev that's happened on every single team that I've worked on. Probably the smoothest sailing has been on, was on the Metroid Prime games, right? Because I joined on at the beginning, near the beginning of Metroid Prime 2. They had already shipped a Metroid Prime game. They understood what a Metroid Prime game was. There was still a lot of creative conflict as to what new ideas do we throw into this thing. But you didn't have arguments about, oh, is it a strategy game? Or, you know, no, it's not a strategy game. It's a Metroid Prime game, right? Is it first person or third person? Well, it's first person in these parts, third person in these other parts, problem solved, right? So it made the, the space of argument of what is this game actually all about much, much smaller. Whereas if you have, you know, a startup that's working on a new franchise, things, you know, everybody's so enthusiastic. Everybody wants to get their ideas into the game. You know, the first year uh, I worked uh, at Gas Powered Games for the first year on Dungeon Siege. And that was a great example of where like people just had completely different visions of what this is. Oh, it's, you know, it's total annihilation, but in a Diablo kind of framework, oh, it's a game about magic and spells. And no, it's all about physics and you got to have arrows flying around and swords clanking off of shields. And, you know, it's, it was chaos really. Um, I, I was not in any sort of production role on that project, but the first year, you know, the, the producers had a really hard time getting anything into a sort of common vision as to what this game was actually about. That's great that you mentioned that. Um, it's funny that they, they wanted to make everything into total annihilation. And mm -hmm. then now there's a bunch of other indie studios also making different versions of total annihilation effectively. Yeah. <laughs> yeah because, well, I mean, that was Chris Taylor, right? Uh, he was the founder of the studio. He had just come off of doing total annihilation at cave dog entertainment. And that was a huge success. And frankly, a great game. It was a, um, it was a, my favorite RTS. I had just come off of making an RTS on my own, you know, war breeds that nobody remembers anymore, you know, and, and got creamed by total annihilation and a lot of the other, you know, RTS games that came out in that huge wave of RTS. Metroid prime two, you were working on, um, were you well versed in this? There's, there's this story that's legend about Metroid Prime One, mm -hmm. about a, a Japanese auteur coming in and and sort of uh, spending the night in the studio and and like asking for a few energy drinks, and then by the by the mm -hmm. uh, next day he's completely redesigned the game and where all the power ups should go and and things like that. <laughs> uh, is is so, that something that 
I don't know of anything like that on Metroid Prime 1, but I know on Metroid Prime 3, there was something similar that happened with Pirate Planet, right? So um, Tanabe-san uh, had um, basically took a look at Pirate Planet uh, in Metroid Prime 3 on a Friday night and basically said, oh, this is not good. Um, and, uh, you know, go home and I'll... We'll talk on Monday. And so he spent the whole weekend in the studio. And then I was not directly involved in any of this, by the way. So this is also secondhand information. But then when he came back into the studio on Monday, it was like, okay, here's the new layout of Pirate Planet. You know, this boss is now going to be in this room. Every single room is connected to a completely different room. Every power up's in a different location, you know, and the whole, that whole part of the game, it wasn't the whole game. It was just the pirate planet, which was maybe like a dozen rooms or, or something like that. 15 rooms, um, you know, just completely overhauled that thing, but it worked. It worked. Yeah. That might've been what I was thinking of over yeah. the years. Maybe it inflated in my head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was a big fan of the, the game outcomes projects uh, when it came out. Um, what, what made you decide to, to fictionalize the data, so to speak? Yeah. So, um, you know, the four swords, it's a game about, uh, sorry, <laughs> the book about, you know, game developers struggling really, really hard. A lot of game developers at, at two different studios struggling really, really hard with very, very difficult situations. Some of the stories are really difficult and there's just so I decided to fictionalize it for two reasons. One is that if I told the truth, I would probably get sued. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there's certainly developers and publishers out there who love to sue people. Um, I've been lucky enough not to get sued. Um, but, you know, things have gotten close to, to getting to the lawyers once or twice in my career. Um, the other reason is nobody would believe it. You know, it's That's like people true. read the four swords and like this, this situation is ridiculous. That never would have happened. And I'm, I keep having to tell them, no, actually I toned it way down from what actually happened. Right. The ridiculous parts are the parts that are the closest to actually being real. The boring parts or the simple parts are the ones that are totally fiction fictionalized. Amazing. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. you know, the, some of the stories in this book are downright wacky and unbelievable. And there's a lot of questions I really want to ask, but I'm, I'm going to practice mm -hmm. some self-restraint. Yeah. I mean, um, the only questions I really can't answer, I don't want to answer like what inspired this particular villain in the book, for example, or this particular oh, sure. individual, especially because really almost every single character is inspired by multiple people in real life. Right. Of There's course, no, yeah. there are very few characters who are based on just, just one person. Yeah. Yeah. In the way that a lot of fiction is, you know, have, has characters that are really several characters sort of rolled into one. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I, there's the questions I want to ask are more along the lines of like, was there really like a lizard guy <laughs> or like, <laughs> so I'll tell you a story. I worked at a certain company many, many, many years ago. And, uh, my lead engineer behind my back basically told people that he believed I was a reptilian. Uh, <laughs> he was a follower of David Icke, you know, that crazy, crazy British guy. I mean, there's, the, there's believing in UFOs, right? Which is, you can lo logically justify that. And then there's believing that you're actually surrounded by shape-shifting lizard people. Right. And that's like a sub, 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 subculture in the <laughs> yeah. much broader culture of people who are starting to take the UFO topic seriously. Um, and he, so anyway, he was a big follower of, of David Icke to my understanding. And I don't know, I think he thought I resembled somebody in the British Royal family and he thought the British Royal family were all reptilians, Oh wow! Uh, which is something Apparently David Icke talks about a lot, but yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, look, there's, you know, for those listening and, and watching, there's a lot of stories like that. It's, uh, I it totally recommends, um, uh, reading the book, but also listening to the book because this is, um, it's the, the audio book for this is kind of the main thing. And it's, it's more of a production, you know, in line with, uh, like if anyone's ever listened to the Sandman on audible, uh, the way it's, you know, it's got actors and sound and music and it's, it's a full on thing. Uh, the, the actors do a great job. Um, and in, in addition to the wacky stuff, like there's a lot of Easter eggs, 
uh, there's a, you know, there's when someone, a character's named Bartle, you know, it puts me in mind of Richard Bartle and the Bartle matrix. And, you know, there's a character that's obviously modeled off of Lord British. And to me, it kind of, with, with all of those things together, it, it feels like kind of a, a celebration of the industry as well. In many ways. Yep. Was it a challenge limiting yourself to just two studios in the book to tell all these stories? Because, yeah, I didn't want to make it more than that because it would have gotten too confusing. Um, I figured, I, you know, I knew I wanted the topic of the book to be about, okay, the four swords, they're the four values that they come up with over the course of the book. You've got four characters, four main characters, but if we had four entirely separate game studios, it would have just been impossible to keep track of everybody. It's all, honestly, it's already hard enough with the two separate studios, plus all the other situations outside of those two studios, um, as well as the parts where they all four characters get together inside of dream of dragons. Um, and that's part of the, the reason I put so much focus into making the audiobook uh, and hiring all these voice actors and to play all these parts, because the way I saw this was, it was like a Netflix series in my head, you know, and I could tell, I knew exactly what every character was going to sound like and what I wanted them to sound like. And when you hear these different people talking, it makes it a lot easier. I think to tell them apart because you hear somebody talking and you're like, okay, that's Bentley. That's Allison, right? It's sort of the opposite of, of Bentley who has the thing where he, he mm -hmm. can't visualize things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Aphantasia. It's a real right. disease. Well, right. uh, disease is the wrong word. It's not like caused by a virus. It's a, it's a condition, I guess, you yeah. know, something like one to 4% of the world population just doesn't have the ability to visualize anything with their, with their mind's eye. An amazing condition for a creative director to have who's talking to an art team describing what he wants. <laughs> yes, yes. In terms of fictionalizing the data, like I think there's there's a lot of value to that, and you know, there's I think it's it's what the industry needs to hear right now, which I'll get to more in a little bit. But you know, there's so many moments in the book where uh, it's like you know these these you could see it in the data when the Game Outcomes Project was released, but. Uh, when it's fictionalized in this way, you really relate to it and you feel seen. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a moment where uh, a worker has been put through the ringer and uh, he just kind of turns off and he says, okay, that's it. No more emotional investment for me. I'm just treating this like a job. You give me the money. Um, you know, my, my creative energy is going elsewhere. I think that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a relatable moment for a lot of people who've, who've yeah. sort of, um, uh, been put through the ringer with their boss. Uh, there's another yeah. one where he visits the boss and he, uh, the boss gets very defensive and sees it as a power play. So he kind of just walks away saying, well, I'm, I'm never raising an issue with him again. Yeah. Um, there's one where a worker looks at the wall and sees the company values written there, but it's just kind of lip service and they're very clearly not, uh, adhering to that. Uh, these are all moments I think, you know, which, which are common, mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, and people relate and these, to, and these are all things that I've seen happen time and again. Right. And part of my writing this book is to make sure that people read this and start to realize like, oh, when I see this happening, that's a huge red flag that something's going on, that something is wrong here. We need to stop, understand what's going on and fix this immediately. When somebody says, Hey, from now on, I'm just doing it for the money, you know, and my heart's not in it. And you know, I'm not going to give you any more feedback than is absolutely necessary. That's a big problem. Now, granted, that's coming from Jake, and Jake is a very difficult character. He's extremely outspoken, right? And he is difficult to deal with. So part of, you know, the reason for that is like, you've got to look from the management side and say, if you are a boss, how do you handle somebody that's this, you know, frankly, blunt, obnoxious at times, extremely outspoken, right? But is also almost always right. So yeah. it can be quite <laughs> difficult. A a tricky one. Yeah. He's very abrasive, quick to anger. Mm -hmm. It's helpful when, you know, when you talk about like red flags and like, uh, I get a lot of like, you know, well, duh. Uh, like, you know, obviously we know that that's, that's, you know, obviously we know crunch is bad. Like obviously we know poor culture is bad. And mm -hmm. I, I say like, yes, it's, you know, it's a, there's a difference between being able to talk about that anecdotally and having some empirical data that you can point to and say, no, look, here are the receipts. Uh, this this leads to a bad place. Let's pay mm -hmm. attention to all of the data, and then on this sort of like on top of that, uh, the the fictionalization of the data gives us something new. Um, I believe it was Supercell who was doing like funerals for dead games, uh, oh, wow. or like celebrations mm -hmm. of dead games, mm -hmm. and um, and then so uh, the that type of thing was just an aside in the game outcomes project, but 
in Four Swords, it's it's kind of like a whole scene, and mm-hmm. you you tell the story of a studio that that throws a funeral uh, yeah. for a dead game. And you're like, why would they do that? And there's a whole cultural reason for it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's a, a, that actually happened. In that case, I think I can tell the story. That sure. was the funeral for Ultima Online Two, and it happened. Almost exactly as described in Austin. Uh, there is a part about a van- an armadillo being on top of the burning pile of design documents and then <laughs> yeah. magically disappearing. That's fiction, right? Obviously. Um, but I remember back when I worked at Ion Storm, Austin, uh, under Warren Spector, between like 2000 and 2002, uh, I, you know, I was a huge fan of all the Origin games. Uh, I grew up playing all the Ultima games, Ultima 1 through 7 Part 2. Uh, sorry, not, not Ultima 1, but Ultima Ultima 2 through 7 point part 2 um and I got invited to the funeral of, of Ultima 2 online and didn't know many of the people there except for the other Ionstorm Austin developers who also you know went there uh and invited me to ta- tag along but you know so that's essentially exactly what they did they took this massive pile of design documents um and lit it on fire and drank beers and you know <laughs> more into the passing of their game and can you um, talk about the importance of that like the cultural significance of that yeah, I mean, you know, certainly from a cultural point of view, I mean, I think you've got to take some time and just emotionally let it go when something like this happens. But a big bigger part of the reason that I put that scene in the book is because it's about design documents and where do design documents fit into the process, right? You've got a whole spectrum of extremes where like there are some studios, uh, my understanding is Bethesda Softworks is a great example of this where they just say, oh, we don't do design documents at all. The game is the design document, right? And then at the other extreme, you have what seemed to be the case, as I understand it, with Ultima Online 2, where you just had this literal gigantic stake full of you know, um, this gigantic pile of papers and they drove a stake through it and and burned it. And that one, that was like one copy of the design documents because they were trying to plan every little thing out in advance and basically create the game on paper. And that's completely unrealistic. And so part of the reason I put it in there was because in the previous chapter, they had been talking about design documents and the lead programmer on a different game had been saying, oh yes, I, we're going to go on strike until every single part of this uh, game is fully mapped out and the de- designers do their jobs and give us the design documents they need, which is kind of an inter- my interpretation of an event that little, literally happened at a certain point in the past. There was a similar fight that broke out at a studio. Um, you know, I wasn't involved in that fight, really, but I saw it happen in front of me. Um, so that extreme of like thinking you can write a huge, massive design document and somehow it'll actually accelerate progress instead of slowing it down. That doesn't work at all. Uh, At the same time, I don't think I'm a fan of Bethesda's model of like, let's just skip design documents entirely for a couple of reasons, because, you know, if you, it's so much easier and faster to design something on paper than it is to make it in any kind of game editor. Even the best editor in the world, even Unreal Engine 5, you know, that's fully customized to your game, it's going to take a lot longer to, you know, create something on there than it will on paper, right? At least putting the big things in paper, having your design pillars written down, having key things mapped out on paper can be hugely productive. So when I worked on Metroid Prime 2 and 3, it was a sort of middle ground where Nobody tried to create all the design docs for the whole game all at once, right? But we had, here's a very short document that's like the game overview, right? This is Metroid Prime 2, and there are going to be bounty hunters. And then we'd send that off to Japan for approval, and that would come back with all the changes they insisted on. Then, okay, this particular boss, you know, Bounty Hunter Rundus, uh, he floats around on a big, you know, he's like the silver surfer and creates a ice in front of him and jumps up on these ice platforms and fires ice projectiles and ice all over the place. Uh, and so I would, there would be like a, th- a four or five page specification document for Bounty Hunter Rundus that I, as the guy who ended up implementing Rundus could take and go, okay, here's how all this is going to work. Here are the animations we need. Here are the particle effects we need. Here's what the arena needs to look like that he's fighting in and then work with all the appropriate animators and particle effects guy and, and the sound effects guy and so on, as well as the designers and iterate on that particular boss. So every weapon had its own little specification document. Every boss had their own specification document. 
every major part of the world, you know, Pirate Planet or Brio or wherever else had their own little design document, specification document, I should say. Do you think there's a rise in managers who don't know how to manage? I think that's always been the case in the video game industry, right? It's not a case of, you know, the video game industry is really weird because we're so insular and we think, hey, we're this unique and special snowflake. We're the only industry where you have programmers and artists and game designers working together. Um, and game designers, that's, you know, that's a discipline that doesn't even exist in any other field at all. Um all these, you know, bringing all three of these disciplines together to make this creative product that is unlike anything else. Right. And it's, it's not even like a movie. This is interactive. It's, it sort of fights back, develops its own personality, its own character over time, very often in ways that you didn't expect. Right. And so it, it really is very, very different from, you know, like my dad's business, making air conditioners, well, selling air conditioners, uh, or, um, you know, making packaged goods or selling cat food or whatever. Uh, it is very, very different at the same time. I think because of that perspective, the game industry has become very insular game developers tend to learn from other game developers. When somebody talks, who's from an industry that's outside games, they don't want to listen to them. They're like, oh, that guy's an investment banker. What could he possibly have to teach me? You know, that person's in, you know, man manufactures women's clothing. What could she possibly teach me? And it's like, no, you know, the principles of leadership and good management are universal, right? We're not this unique and special snowflake. Um, group personalities, group psychology are a is a thing. Um, the rules of management and good leadership really are a thing. And we very much are an industry that promotes from within, right? I've heard countless and seen countless cases of studios where they say, okay, we need somebody in the senior position. Okay. It's a senior art position. Bob's the best artist we have. So promote him to senior artist. Suddenly Bob is no longer making art, right? Making art is what he's good at. Managing people happens to be something he's absolutely terrible at. They put him in that job. They give him no training whatsoever. They don't teach him what the expectations are. They don't explain to to Bob, here's our culture. Here are the here are the values that we're trying to preserve in this culture. They just go, all right, you're senior now, Bob. And you're responsible for all these people. Make sure the work gets done on time, you know. And then, more often than not, Bob just turns into you know a, basically a bully, you know, just trying to harangue people into getting the job done on time, forcing them to work crunch and so on. So we promote from within uh, far more often than not. Uh, we don't learn from other industries outside the game industry that have been doing this for decades, if not centuries. Uh, and we don't provide any training when we put people in positions of leadership. And very often we don't look for the right attributes in people we hire to leadership positions. So very often it'll be who's the loudest and most aggressive person in the room, which often is the last person you want to be actually leading a team of people. So much wisdom in what you just said. I, I think this is the stuff that the industry really needs to hear. Uh, and, and, you know, I've seen like the stuff that you just said, I've, you know, I've been covering games and interviewing developers since 2006. I've, I've had them tell me what you just said, you know, that I've had them say like, look, I, I was promoted away from my creative work. Uh, you know, I was doing well in my job and and they wanted to promote me. And then I'm now I'm doing less creative work. I'm, I'm not happy. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. leaving the studio and, um, and it, there's, there is that interesting thing. I mean, you know, when like it's in our culture, I guess you, you take the promotion, right? It's, it's what mm -hmm. your parents have always yeah. told you to do, you know, work your way up the ladder, uh, blah, blah, blah. But there's this interesting thing that happens when you, uh, when you're not prepared for that level of power and you mm -hmm. kind of touched on it there when you, when you mentioned, uh, becoming a bully. And there's a story about this in, in four swords, the book as well. Um, and it's something I've noticed as well, where it's like, it's, it's people have interesting reactions when they're put in a, in a position of power and they mm -hmm. don't quite know what to do with it. Yeah. So for me, I would say the biggest problem is the video games industry has developed production culture, right? You have all these people from all these different professions and you hire these people you call producers to come in, organize the schedules, go around, check on everybody's daily tasks, make sure everybody's talking to each other and so on. And 
I have seen very few studios where producers actually make a positive difference in the long run, right? Uh, where they really understand what their job is at a deep level, which is not just managing everybody's tasks on a little spreadsheet, you know, and going around and haranguing people. It's actually, you're in a leadership position when you're in a producer, right? They don't say it's a leadership position, but it very, very much is. And big part of the reason that I wrote the book is to illustrate to people what the job of a leader is. What's going to create the results at your company is the culture. It's uh, Drucker, uh, the famous management thinker, once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And culture is what creates the results. Your values as an organization are what define your culture. They're what create your culture. And so in many ways, companies that have thought about their values have a big leg up because they can say, here's what we're all about. We're only going to hire people who are compatible with these values. We're only going to promote people to the next level once they show that they work with these values. And if we find somebody's not compatible with these values, we're either going to fix that or we're going to get them out of our studio because these values are what we're all about. So many stories of studios that are small, suddenly they have their first big hit, they hire on a bunch of people, and now their culture is destroyed because all these new people that you brought on don't understand the culture. They don't fit into the culture. Some of them are hostile to the culture that you've had up to that point, uh, and everything just absolutely shatters. Um, so producers really need to understand that they're very, very much in a leadership position. The thing that they need to do to be the most effective is understand the culture, right? And you can take a short term view of, oh, I've got to get this task done by Thursday. I've got to get the art stuff to the publisher by Tuesday of next week, you know, and that's great. No denying that stuff's got to get done. Uh, and I'm certainly not beyond putting in a little overtime myself. I've done that in the past, but the more important thing is to understand what culture are we building? Every single thing you do, every decision that you make as a producer, as a leader in a game studio, you are defining that culture, right? And as a leader, everyone else is going to model their values after the values that you express in the decisions that you make and the ways that you behave. Right. And so it's important to put a lot of time into an energy and thought into thinking about what do we need? To, where, what are we as a studio and what do we need to be as a studio? What's the next level of success that we need to get to as a studio what are the what are the cultures that we've shown in the past? What are the cultures that are going to allow us to be really, really successful in the future, right? And then evolve those values. Maybe it's, you know, in the form of a written value statement that you actually change and discuss with the team. But in any case, you've got to understand what are those values? How are they building that culture? And then how are we reinforcing that culture every day with the way we interact with our team, with the way we act? you know, ask people questions with the way we behave during a team meeting, with the way we hire people, with the way, with who we fire, with how we promote all of that. You know, you mentioned a aggressive hiring there, which I think is, is a lot of studios went through, um, in the last few years. And that might be a good jumping off point, mm -hmm. uh, into our current moment, because I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, uh, you know, the 2023's massive layoffs, which look to be continuing probably all the way through 2024. Uh, you know, the, when the game outcomes project sort of came out, it was, it was before a lot of things. Uh, it was, <laughs> mm -hmm. it was before COVID is before, um, aggressive money printing by the fed. It was, you know, mm -hmm. inflation and, and then interest rate hikes and, um, supply chain issues and war. And, you know, there's, yep. um, there's a lot of things that have happened since then. Uh, but when you look at our current moment, how much of this do you think is external extraneous uh, factors and how much of it is the same kind of management mistakes that you uncovered in 2015? Yeah. I mean, I do think a very large part of it is many companies in the game industry still not evolving, still not taking leadership and management seriously, still not providing any internal training, still not doing what they need to do to up their game. Um, you know, Epic Games, good example. I mean, I hate to criticize them because I love Fortnite 
avid Fortnite fan and Epic and I love the Unreal Engine. Oh my God, do I love it. And, you know, I've got nothing but respect for Epic, but at the same time, they made some really basic mistakes. They just hired too many people. They, you know, didn't manage their revenue streams, you know, carefully enough. And then they ended up having to lay off, what was it? 800 people, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget the exact number. Yeah. But it seems like every, I mean, it seems like every company's doing that and they're, they're in a particular mm -hmm. situation where it's like when your game is that popular that quickly mm -hmm. and they're, they're clearly trying to maintain a content pipeline of like having some, some mm -hmm. new thing, like every week or two weeks for yeah. people to keep it fresh for people. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems pretty clear, you know, Fortnite was so massively successful and they're like, woo, you know, now we've got more money than God and we can go do whatever we want. And you know, some of those decisions I'm sure were good ones. And some of them, they should have been revisited a lot earlier, you know, or should not have been made in the first place. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not an economist, but, uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. I do like, <laughs> you know, it, it does seem, maybe this is just hindsight, but it, it seems like mm -hmm. what goes up must come down. Right. Like it, yeah, it seems it's, there's a story in, uh, the four swords that one of the scenes is this big meeting, uh, that, uh, that happens, um, at, uh, scrub liminal studios, um, which I think at that point had been renamed to something else. Um, and, uh, but basically the producer, you know, lead producer gets up and says, I'm sorry, guys, we just did the math. And, you know, based on our revenue expectations and our increasing costs on this game, we're going to have to lay a bunch of people off when we ship. And I just wanted to be honest and upfront about it. And that actually happened at a studio that I worked at, which shall go unnamed. Cause again, I don't want to get sued. Um, but it was about nine months, well, nine months, about a year and a half into a certain studio that I was at and they just honestly hadn't been tracking the money, right? They were getting all this money from their publisher, spending it like there's no tomorrow. And then suddenly realizing the kind of trouble that they were in and how much longer this is going to take than they expected. And suddenly having to tell people there's going to be layoffs, you know, we're going to ship this game in six months and half of you are going to be gone. And, and a big part of that, a big part of that, to my understanding is honestly, the, lead, the head of that studio just didn't like spreadsheets, right? He was <laughs> hated doing, hated doing the math, hated building spreadsheets and just, oh man, yeah, that's the story I heard. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, yeah, definitely like, especially when you put it like that, like in, in that situation, it's irresponsible and unethical, but I, I look at, you know, a lot of the hiring practices and, you know, I, I don't know the full story and I, I do get that things, definitely things happen, you know, unforeseen things, but, mm -hmm. um, to, for the companies who were kind of pretending to their shareholders that the good times were going to go on forever, mm -hmm. that seems irresponsible to me and, and yeah. unethical. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. It really is. If you were an investor looking at the gaming space and you, you kind of know what you know, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in this current moment. We we've had all these layoffs and you know mm -hmm. what you know about psychological safety and institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. Are big gaming publishers still attractive to you? Uh, yeah. So I would say I personally would never invest in the video game space at this point, no matter how much money I had. But if somebody came to me and said, Hey Paul, I got a buddy, you know, he he wants to invest however many million dollars in a bunch of game developers, game publishers, whatever, I would do everything I could to help that person out and make good decisions because honestly, there are too many people, too many developers out there who just, I don't understand how they keep getting funded, right? People who are horrible to work with, people who are verbally abusive to their teams, incredibly disrespectful, who make terrible decisions time and time again. And you want to go to these investors and just throttle them because of like, this guy hasn't made a good game since 1995. Why are you still throwing money at them? Right. And a lot of people out there are just so good at the sales pitch that I think that can make up for a complete lack of talent and a complete failure to learn anything at all over the last two decades about how to be successful as a game developer and how things have changed and what you now need to do differently. Uh, I th honestly, I think some of the investors are the biggest problem in the game space right now because some of the projects they're funding are just mind boggling to me of like, I sense you're talking how they about expect to re recoup this. I, I'm not going to admit who I'm talking about. No, right? no, that's fine. Yeah. I, 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 I sense that you're talking about auteurs and, and the sort of mm -hmm. cult of personality mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the weight that a name can bring. 
Yeah, that's that's certainly part of it, right? People who are like, oh, I made this amazing hit game in the 90s, or at least my name was on the box, you know, and then they haven't had a hit since then. And they've made a dozen projects that have all failed, but keep people keep throwing money at them. You know, it is, it's just insane. One of the things that I wish game investors would do is try, try to have a better understanding of the leadership skills of the management team and what is the culture of the studio that you're working at and what kind of culture does it need to have to really be successful? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my sort of, you know, in, in the role of critic and reviewer, my motto there has been, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Uh, you, you can't let the past glow uh, yeah. affect what's happening right now. Yeah. Uh, there's one theme that, uh, from four swords that I really wanted to touch on, which is, um, uh, there's strong themes around trying to design on paper without iteration and trying things mm -hmm. out. And, uh, one thing that you keep coming back to is iteration is search. Yeah. That's one of my favorite quotes from the book. You know, there's a certain point in the book where Adam, who's, you know, this, um, video game consultant, um, is talking to all four of the heroes and basically explaining to them, you know, every studio iterates on their game vision but what are you actually doing when you're iterating, right? You, you try a bunch of stuff and then you say, okay, now let's make a bunch of changes. Then let's make a bunch of changes from that. Let's make a bunch of changes from that, right? That's iteration, right? And a good way to think about it is in terms of search, right? Like search means a bunch of different things. I've done a lot of AI development. So search means one example of search is pathfinding. You've got a character in a, a certain spot in the game world. Maybe it's, say it's a grid for the sake of simplicity. He's down here. He needs to get up here. And so he's going to search through all those little boxes to try and find, oh, there's a wall here. Now search down here. Nope. Can't go there. Now search over here. Okay. I can go now go around this way. And so you end up searching through 357 different boxes to, to you find, oh, I need a path that goes like this around the obstacle, right? You're essentially doing a similar thing when you're iterating on a game. You're starting out and saying, okay, let's make a video game. Is it going to be first person or third person? Is it going to have this or this? Is it going to do, you know, um, or how big are ranged weapons versus spells versus melee weapons? And is blocking with your shield going to be important? All of these different things. And so every iteration, you're essentially saying, here's what we're going to be working on for the next four weeks, the next six weeks, however long your sprint may be. And trying to get to the next level so that you can see how it works out. Now, you, there's no way to be psychic because, you know, it's fiendishly difficult to tell exactly how, what the ramifications of all of those decisions are going to be. I'm not claiming you can perfectly know what set of decisions is best along the way, but essentially a good way to think of it is search of, we have all these options for here, are 10 different features that we could add in the next sprint. We have enough resources to do four of them. Which four do we think are going to add the most value to this game in the four to six weeks that we have? Um, and it's really important to pick very, very carefully and be as close to correct as possible, right? and come up with the best set of things to work on so that then you can see how they work out and be in a better position. You're like at the next cell in that pathfinding grid. So you're a little bit closer to your goal. Um, and then you can decide what are the different options for what we can do for the next sprint. So it's not really like searching on a grid because it's this complex multi-dimensional space of like iterating on different possible permutations of features simultaneously. Right. And it's not necessarily, four out of 10 possible features. It's more like, okay, we've got a, we've got X number of features, but those will take different amounts of art resources, design resources, engineering resources, and maybe two of them we could get done in a day, but one of them is going to take the entire sprint. And then the rest of them are somewhere in between in terms of levels of, of complexity. So it's a very complex problem in terms of what, which features do you pick? Where do you really focus your resources to be in the next, the best possible position for the next sprint? Um, you know, and so you'll see a lot of studios, you know, when they're working with a publisher, the publisher wants to see results right away. And so they put all this effort into making all these fancy models, you know, making really highly polished animations very, very early in the project. 
in order to impress the publisher, not to create the best game possible. And so it's now like they're doing pathfinding and they're already path starting to pathfind in the wrong direction because those models probably have too many polygons in them, materials and textures are too big, too complicated. Um, you know, these animations are too complex. Those are going to be have to be simplified. You might not even need those animations anyway once you figure out what game you're making. And because the publishers are demanding results and a lot of the developers are saying we've got to impress them really quick quickly with results um you know they end up getting distracted and it takes them a lot longer to figure out what's the right way to make our game and pathfind toward that goal whereas studios that have a certain amount of independence and the publisher goes away and they say we're going to leave you alone for nine months and then come back and take a look at what you're doing suddenly those guys have much better odds of actually creating something great they don't have a publisher to impress they can iterate on what actually matters for the gameplay try things really quickly with ugly art just placeholder graphics throw shit away that doesn't work very quickly publisher never even needs to know we explored that blind alley for two days and it didn't work out who cares now now here's the game we're making now make a good looking model based on that in the eighth months for when the publisher is going to be here on month nine. Right. Yeah. That's such a great way to put it. Um, the vertical slice is a bad search protocol. Yeah. It's a bad search algorithm. It's like, you know, yeah. as you were talking about, you know, finding your way through the maze, it's like you can have different protocols for finding your way through the maze. One of them is always turn left. And you'll yeah. get to the end, but like, you know, it's <laughs> part of it is it's finding very it. often going to be the worst way to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I guess part of the design work is, is finding, I mean, you know, there, it lines up with that saying, finding, find the fun, which uh -huh. is, you know, a semantic thing, but I guess it plays into this iteration as search thing because part of the design mm -hmm. work is finding your own protocol for doing this, this kind of iteration. Yeah. Yep. So you you mentioned in the Four Swords book, um, on, on this point, I'm just kind of referring to my notes and, and trying to remember exactly what it was, but you uh, you mentioned that your, um, you had a business professor, Adam Grant, mm -hmm. who taught you identical team building lessons mm -hmm. uh, uh, to what your dad was teaching you. Yes. Um, and uh, this, this sort of put me in mind of just more institutional lessons that that we just refuse to learn, yes. um, but they're out there. And there was a moment in the book as well where a character kind of visits uh, his family's business, uh, which is just in a you know run of the mill. I forget what it was like refrigerators, air, con air, con air conditioning, right, right, directly based on you know my own history because my dad owned an air conditioning company until he sold it in 2022. Yeah, but so, and the, yeah. I mean the funny thing about that story, which and you know I I I see this in real life as well, is people there were happy. Yeah. You know, it yeah. wasn't like the, it wasn't yeah. the, the mm -hmm. magic and the pomp of the games industry, but yeah, they were content. Yeah. You know, I used to have this, you know, attitude about the air conditioning industry of like, Oh my God, this is so boring. <laughs> and these people are selling air conditioners and it's like, Oh, I couldn't do this. There's nothing, you know, and it's just like, it just felt like, Dullsville to me. It's like you're, literally their entire job is just selling these big machines that all they do is keep the air at a constant temperature all day long and nothing even remotely creative or exciting in that. And so as a child, I never wanted to be in dad involved in my father's air conditioning business. Um, and, uh, you know, and wanted to be involved in video games. And I felt like I was drawn to that. And one of the things that I realized more and more as I visited his office occasionally, as I got older and older and got more experience in the game industry was how professional everybody was right. And their management team was just absolutely top notch, uh, compared to any game studio I had ever worked with. It was like night and day in terms of building good teams, building good cultures, getting results, tracking results. It was, it was astounding. Um, and so realizing how arrogant I had personally had been, you know, that's a, a realization that Leo Henderson goes through during the book, realizing how personally arrogant I had been in thinking this way about this company that 
you know, provided this great service to so many different companies and, and hospitals all around the, you know, Philadelphia and South Jersey area, you know, was incredibly financially successful, was incredibly professionally run, was in uh, Philadelphia Magazine's list of best places to work, I think like 10 years in a row, something like that. Uh, right. And I should have just gone to them cap in hand and said, teach me everything you can so I can learn how to do it the way you guys do so that then I can bring that back to the video game industry and have wow, something yeah. that's that professionally run. And it, the, the focus seems to be different as well. I mean, if, if the story in the book is, you know, uh, is a true parallel to real life, then, uh, you know, they, they have a sense of contributing to society, but also their, their focus is the customer. Yeah. Um, whereas the focus in the games industry, uh, you know, and, and I'm talking about the book here, uh, mm -hmm. The characters in the book, the, the focus seems to be more on their creative vision or like, yes. you know, what, what is my creative vision and how it's, it's more about me uh, than where, as opposed to, and the, the outside the games industry was like, how can I help people? It's exactly it. That's exactly it. So one of the parts of the book that's directly inspired by real life is during that scene, Leo goes to Don into, you know, he's sitting outside Don's office and there's this logo on the wall. We want every customer to say, we want Henderson on our next job. And literally that was a logo hanging on the wall at my father's company. That's except great. of course it said Tozer and not Henderson. Right. Yeah. Um, but that was how fanatical they were about customer service. They were absolutely fanatical about making sure every customer was happy at all times. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about every video game studio I've worked at, like, what did they do to interact with customers? Well, none of the developers interacted with customers really in any way other than maybe arguing with them on the forums after the game shipped, right? <laughs> what did they do to figure out what the customer actually wanted from the game? There were a couple of cases where they did focus group testing, got actual potential customers into a room and watched how they played the game. And there was, there were things to be learned from that, but that really was just about it. Right. Um, it was not really about understanding your audience, understanding who are we trying to target here? What design decisions are going to make those customers happy, uh, and really make them want to buy this game and make them love it. It was much more about designers going, Oh my God, Halo is so awesome. We got to put all this stuff from Halo in our game because Halo is the thing, right? And that's one of the reasons I liked working at Nintendo because they didn't design that way. You don't go into Nintendo and say, oh, well, Halo did. The moment you say Halo or some other game, you know, they'll just say, no, 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 no. We don't want to hear about <laughs> any of that, right? They designed from first principles. They understand game design at the level of design principles of what is the experience we're trying to give the player at this particular point in the game? What are the emotions that the player is intended to have? What tools does the player have at their disposal? How much have we taught the player about how to use the morph ball or the this particular plasma cannon or the missiles or whatever? And how does that inform how this particular segment of the game should be designed? Um, you know, and uh, every time I hear American game designers bring up other games as a frame of reference, in terms of the game they're currently making, mm. I want to slap the fucking shit out of them. Pardon my French. I don't know if I'm <laughs> allowed to say it on your podcast. It's that's just, yeah, it's fun. It's just like, you're an amateur. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about like in this moment, rather than referring to another game, they should be referring to like what feeling the player should be having. They should be referring to deeper design principles, right? Okay. So you like this particular thing in Halo. What is the design principle in Halo that's creating the fun in that particular part of Halo? And would that fit into our game? And if so, how, right? It's not necessarily what Halo is doing is wrong or that it wouldn't fit into our game. It's just, you can't design by just shoveling parts of other games into your game. You've got to understand the context of what does this particular game need, you know? And if you're a good enough game designer, you're not going to be thinking about any other game while you're making your game. You're going to be thinking about my game needs this. Therefore, here's what I'm going to add here. Here's what I'm going to add here. You know, 
we want the player to be scared at this particular point in time. Maybe that's the emotion you're, you're trying to make them feel, you know, you're trying to make them empowered because they just got this shield and they can block incoming shots. And we've just taught, given them the shield and taught them to use the B button to block with the shield for the rocket exploding when it hits the shield this particular way, because it's going to now going to make the, the player feel empowered. There's so much I love there because you know, I feel like there's too much designing from the gut. And it ties into what I love about mm -hmm. the decision modeling thing that you did on the intelligence engine. And, and you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's seeing design as more of a science. Like there's always going to be an element that's art, mm -hmm. but there are some things that are objective. And, you know, I, this is one thing that I try to do in reviewing games as well. And I try to communicate with other reviewers mm -hmm. and, you know, I've been involved in with some websites and, and coming up with their rubric for scoring games. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to tell them that some things are objective. Like yeah. you can actually map out the mechanics and dynamics of say for, you know, this is just an example off the top of my head, but you know, if, if, uh, you have a first person shooter and, you know, like a counter-strike or something and two players spawn at the other ends of the map, opposite ends of the map. When they get to the conflict zone, mm -hmm. one player might have a line of sight before the other player, right? Because mm -hmm. of the way the geometry lines up. If yeah. one player has a line of sight and the, that it gets to the line of sight before the other player, there needs to be counterplay for that. Right. Uh, if there's not counterplay, that's bad design. And that, that is like an objective thing. It's not, it's not from the gut. It's not subjective. Yeah. yeah. Because then that one player who gets there first would realize, okay, this is a sweet spot. I just stand here. Now I've got an unfair advantage over the other player. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, it's, it, it requires the reviewer to put their finger on it. Uh, yeah. you know, it, it, there's, there's like a lot of reviewers like to say like, I had fun doing this or I had fun doing that without or they might say like, I couldn't put my finger on it, but this was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. I'm like, it's your job to put your finger on it. Yeah. Uh, just as you're saying, like, you know, you want your designers to like, put your finger on what, like the design principles of what you found fun in this situation. Yes. 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 And that American designers need to be able to do that. Many of them can. It's certainly not a blanket criticism, right? There's all kinds of designers out there at all different skill levels, right? But I think it needs to be an expectation. You need to be able to understand the deeper design principles of what you're, you're building and not be the guy saying, oh, Wing Commander did this, so we need to have it in our game, right? No Man's Sky did that. We need to have it in our game. And constantly designing by comparison. Going going through your journey uh, as as the the prodigal son who who came around to uh, the appreciation of his father's management practices and uh, mm -hmm. an attitude towards the customer did did it mm -hmm. um, did that sort of journey uh, make you more proud of your father and more appre oh, appreciative? Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, a thousand percent. I mean, he he did an amazing job. Um, you know, he took over from a fairly toxic manager, right? And so things were not good. And he was really able to turn it around, get everybody being very, very positive, um, and just make it a, a fun place to work. Um, you know, a place where, you know, people were appreciated, where they were empowered, you know, where they felt like they could speak up. Yeah. And again, the fact that they've been on Philadelphia Magazine's list of best places to work for something like 10 years in a row. Um, and they make a point of that, right? They make a point of going, we we're so, we care so much about being a great place to work that we're going to set up a best places to work committee, make sure we air those issues out. If there's any issues that make, that are making people think this is not one of Philadelphia area's best places to work. We want to weed that out and fix it. Right. That's so good. And, and then they end up fixing problems as soon as they happen. Right. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, there were certainly a couple cases in my career where I'd be, you know, there'd be annual performance reviews and I'd get this performance review and I'm like, if this particular thing is true, you should have told me this is a problem nine months ago. Why is it the first time I'm hearing that this is a problem? Right. Um, yeah it's infuriating and it's, and you get the sense that these managers save these things up because they need to be able to fill things in, in the annual performance review. And it's like, no, this is serious. If there's a problem, you want to fix it right away. And if I'm the problem, make sure I fix it right away or that I leave. Right. Yeah. I hate that mentality. Yeah. The, the politician mentality of fixing something before an election. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
You mentioned Nintendo. Uh, could yeah. you uh, talk about your time there? Yeah, it was Retro Studios, which is a fully owned subsidiary of Nintendo. They used to be a separate studio. Um, there was a, a guy by the name of Jeff Spangenberg, it's my understanding, who I've never met, never worked for. Um, but he ended up selling the studio to Nintendo, I think for $1 is the story that I heard. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because of some things that went on there. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Okay. Yeah. There's some <laughs> stories, but I don't know them well enough to tell them. Four so. Swords 2? Yeah, no, I, I was, I was, that was way before my time. So I'd, I'd be telling secondhand stories and I wouldn't want to do that. It's been one of my things, like I, I love audiobooks, and it's been one of my things to mm -hmm. listen to memoirs and I, I love listening to memoirs of like, um, mm -hmm. uh, activists and comedians and, and games industry people is, is one of the big ones, you know, mm -hmm. Sid Meier's and, uh, there was the guy who, um, started Sierra online and, you know, he, mm -hmm. he was talking about unionization in his book and how he felt yeah. betrayed in the lead up to one particular release. There was excessive crunch, mm -hmm. which made them decide to have a vote about forming a union. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of talk about that these days. You know, there's a lot of talk about unionization and, uh, and the co-op model are management practices not going to get better until they're forced. So for me, I would ask the question, are unions actually going to fix that particular problem, right? Can I point to an industry where there was unionization and then things got a lot better, right? I can certainly point to industries like the auto industry where there was a lot of unionizations and things got a lot worse very quickly. Um, I worry that what's going to happen with unionization just from a pragmatic level is American video game developers unionize. And now all the publishers go, okay, we'll just get cheaper talent in Japan, in South Korea, in different European countries, in South America, in Mexico, wherever, right? There's already a lot of outsourcing to these other countries. Um, that could, I worry that could very easily happen. Um, I, you know, I don't want to be, you know, state a strong opinion on uni unionization. Again, I am skeptical about it, but I'm not saying it's necessarily the wrong thing to do because I can't say what the results would be, but I'm very skeptical that that's what the game industry needs right now. Right. I think what it does need is better management and that's going to happen something that's going to happen gradually through the inside, through individuals at all these various companies upping their game. It's taking a while, isn't it? Like for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the games industry to, to sort its stuff out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can understand the desire to try to affect change from the bottom up. You do, you do end up managing up always to some extent, right? You end up managing your relationship with your superiors, right? And then hopefully doing it well, right? And hopefully it's a, a teaching experience where they mold you and you mold them right back, right? In both of you in better ways. Um, but that's optimistic and very often that doesn't happen, right? With all that's happened in the last few years, uh, if you were to do an updated version of the Game Outcomes Project, how would you do it differently? Yeah, you know, so I did try and do another version of, of the Game Outcomes Project, um, tried to get it off the ground like five years after the first one happened, but just the people, it, it was always, always ended up becoming just too much of a one-man show, um, and I wasn't able to get enough participation from the people that I was working with. Uh, you know, it's really hard to do a joint effort like that, um, but I thought about doing a bunch of, you know... Basically, there were two things that I wanted to, to try to do. One was just taking the first version of the Game Outcomes Project saying, okay, here are the high value questions. We know these have strong correlations with outcomes. Let's keep those. Let's throw away a lot of the low value, all the low value ones. Um, take the ones in the middle, see if we can change them, make them better, but then add new categories of things like, Hey, did you work in open offices or cubicles? Or did you have a door that you can shut? How often were you allowed to work from home? Do things like quantifying what does crunch mean, right? Cause there's some developers where, Oh my God, I had to work, you know, an extra hour out of my nine to five <laughs> schedule, you know, and go home an hour late on Thursday afternoon. Right. And 
other developers would be like, oh, I only worked 60 hours this week. That's not even crunch. <laughs> uh, <you know? laughs> so um, it's trying to quantify how many hours per week are we talking about over how long a time period? How does that correlate with, with project outcomes, things like that? So the second thing that I wanted to do was also find some game studios, several of them, you know, as many as would be willing to participate give a lot of culture questions to the studio and then just see how they did over time and how things evolved with that particular studio. What about you personally? Uh, it seems mm -hmm. like, um, you know, uh, I, I, it seems like I follow you around from thing to thing and it, yeah. you know, every new thing you do, I'm like, Oh, that's, that's an awesome thing. Can I cool. create some content around that? And then you do well, something else. And I'm like, Oh, that's an awesome thing. Can I create some content around that? So, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm honestly done with the video game industry at this point. Writing the four swords uh, is probably the last thing that I'm ever likely to participate in relative to the video game industry. Um, right now I'm pretty much retired. Uh, I'm working on some other stuff that it's way too early to talk about, but it's not related to video games at all. Um, and, uh, from you judging know, I'm, from I'm LinkedIn, some longevity mm -hmm. stuff or yeah, I'm into longevity, biohacking stuff, gene therapy, amazing things going on in the anti-aging space right now. Well, you heard it here first. Paul Tozer's next book is, uh, <laughs> Playing, I don't playing know. the long game. I've got yeah, a title for you. Playing the long game. I don't know that I'm going to write a book about any of this stuff that's going on in the longevity space either because I want to and I feel qualified to in many ways, but the science is changing so fast that I feel like by the time it even hit the shelves, it would be obsolete. But yeah, I've been focusing on just staying healthy, getting married. I uh, got married in July of last year, starting oh, a family now. So um, yeah, working on my family. Excellent. That sounds lovely. Yeah. That's, that's all the questions I had for you, but, um, if mm -hmm. there's anything else that you wanted to mention, or if you wanted to like spruik something or shout something out, mm -hmm. um, I definitely want to give you that space. Okay. Um, yeah, just, just referring back to what we were talking about before, uh, with iteration of search, right? I used to do this little thought experiment where I would think to myself, like, what if you had an AI that could evolve the ultimate game design document? Right? <laughs> like, type into chat GPT, write me the ultimate game design document. And it could somehow know, is this program that's amazingly smart, could somehow know exactly what your audience wanted. And any sentence that belongs in that design document, you know, it stays in there. Any text that doesn't belong in that design document gets weeded out with the process of evolution, you know. And, um, you know, there, there's this very simple thought of experiment to, uh, explain gen uh, genetic algorithms and genetic programming where the target is the sentence, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And you just start with random letters, groups of random letters, and you use evolutionary algorithms, crossover and mutation and things like that to take random strings of letters, including the spaces, right? And periods, um, mix them and breed them. And you do that for enough generations and you'll eventually end up with the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. It takes maybe like a hundred generations to get to that, depending on what your, you know, probability of a crossover mutation is or, and, and so on. Uh, but you'll eventually get your target sentence just evolving to it and using the scoring function that rewards each of those letters being in the correct place in that sentence, right? And so what if you could somehow design a program that would figure out the ultimate game design document and figure out what's the 5,000 words or 50,000 words that describes the ultimate game, right? So that's <laughs> one way to think about iteration being searched. You're searching for what is the best possible game, right? Mm. And the code, you can think about it that way as well, right? For this particular game we're trying to make, the code is evolving into some state, right? If you were able to somehow search and figure out, here's what the code's ultimately going to look like, right? Then you could evolve towards that. And so it's the same thing with every aspect of game development, art and sound effects and design and so on. So that's kind of what I mean by, by iteration is search. You have, you have a very effective uh, scoring mm -hmm. system in the optimizer, which is fun. Yeah. Yeah, fun exactly. Fun. Which is how much, how much fun is it and how well does it align with the design pillars that we agreed on when we started this game, which is hopefully something that you have in place of like, this is the game we're trying to make. And you hear all these stories of, 
even veteran game developers and auteurs who are like, oh, you know, I just played this game and there was this amazing third person camera and people are like, but it's a first person game. Well, now it's third person. And so they spend months <laughs> putting in this third person camera and turning it into a third person game and like, no, go back to that, being that's our first point person. Of differentiation is yeah. Like <laughs> and now you've just wasted months humoring this guy. Oh, geez. Yeah. Uh, just going down this blind alley that now you have to come back from to get mm. to where you need to go and your pathfinding has failed. Thank you so much uh, for doing this and for chatting to me. And, and also, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your work. Thank you so much awesome. for um, Thanks so much, Ray. The, the Jeremy. Book. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, the, the game outcomes project. I was a big fan of the book. I'm a big fan. Uh, obviously I was a big fan of um, the decision modeling blog posts, which allowed me to beat my friends in Neptune's Pride too. So thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> I pleasure. was able to turn it into content for Kotaku as well. So thank you very much for that. Awesome. Uh, awesome. <laughs> so uh, cheers, man. I, I'm very appreciative. Uh, and thank you for bringing what you bring to the world. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And anybody wants to reach out, don't hesitate. I always love to talk.